Check out my wood pile. I'm getting there. Getting there. Pretty big chunks of wood. I don't know. I think I probably got maybe a couple more days of bucket it up left. I'm just chipping at it until it gets too hot. And then I have to get a splitter in here and get all this split. Get it all stacked up. Maybe I'll hang out out here for a minute with the coffee and me and the Ruby dog will get some, get some voices shared. Dump for my coffee. What was I thinking? All right. <clears throat> this ought to do it. Outside. I heard frickin' animals is fed. Mm -hmm. Chaos, man. It is chaos in that house. Actually, the little place is chaos. Animal chaos. Now, uh, quick mention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's funny when you share online, when you when you speak clearly to a microphone and a lens like this, speaking clear English, and the amount of people that do not hear <laughs> plain clear English is, is is can be somewhat surprising and frustrating. Now, what, one of the things that I have been trying to get people to do, encourage people to do, is. Uh, realize that everybody's on their own individual ride and as soon as you accept that fact it makes everything way more easier next to no conflict right when everybody respects each other's ride and encourages each other to take from things what you will or leave it how many times have we said that now right and as well uh, how many times have i said for me nobody should give a shit what i think about anything i'm just a messenger right the odd time I'll share with you guys what I possibly think is true or not and I always end with I might be wrong who knows who am I right well uh, some people I know are frustrated because I do not I tell you flat out I don't I don't read the comments I just don't the odd times I do sometimes but very rarely and here's an example of why I don't you know we put that photograph up that person emailed in that photograph of the alleged Sasquatch standing beside a man. 
Asked me to share it. Asked the people to see if they could prove it was not real. Okay. Well, meanwhile, in the past on this channel, I've stated, I don't know how many times, personally, me, I don't really give a shit about photos. I don't care. I'm beyond it. I've seen one of these beings. Did I see the face of the, did I see the face of the being that was looking at me off that rock? Nope. Like I said, quite in clear, plain English, I said I saw the silhouette. It was pitch black with that bright September sky. I never saw the face of it. So I've got nothing to compare compare that to what I saw. Um, but it was as amazing, surprising is at this stage of the game with all of you here, I went down the comments section in a photograph, for the photograph I think it was, in the community page, whatever it was. And the amount of people that are here that are angry, lashing out and insulting and trying to belittle is, was, kind of took me back. I'm like, holy shit, really? I thought that, I thought we were at that stage <clears throat> of having people like that here uh, a couple years ago. I thought we weeded everybody out. I thought we got it across clearly to everyone that everybody's on their own personal ride. If they don't agree with, with you, big deal. Who gives a shit? Amazing, isn't it? I mean, all I said about... What I mentioned about that photo was, well, my gut's kind of saying who created this, and it doesn't really mesh up for me what our typical broad daylight description has been from thousands of people. That's all I said. But the amount of people who blew a gasket went about trying to insult me and others over a photograph on this channel was really took me back. And uh, it's hard for me to bite my lip at times because it's like, you know, when somebody brings it to me, I, I'll admit it, it's one of my weaknesses. I, I can't walk away. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's go. So, um, that's another one of the stronger reasons why I stay away from the comment section, because of that. But I'll do what I do recognize and acknowledge that there are far more, far more very intelligent, very kind, rational thinking people here, and I appreciate every one of you, big time. Big, I can't explain, I can't get across clearly how much I appreciate all of the good people here. I'm just saying, for all for the people that who are snapping, pulling a snap sandwich, blowing a gasket over a effing photo at this stage of the game, get your head out of your greasy butthole. My, my God, how can you be that far behind at this stage of the game? How? And to furthermore go about insulting people because of their stance on a photograph at this stage of the game? Are you that stupid and clueless? Seriously. <laughs> oh my God. There's so many people coming here where their lives have been altered. Their lives have been changed from what they've seen. They've, they've lost relationships. They've lost family members. Contact family members. They've lost their jobs. They've been discredited. They've suffered PTSD. They won't go in the woods anymore. They can't keep their eyes off their children in the yard and feel like they're the worst parent in the world. There's all these important things to think and talk about and, and bring awareness to. And there's, I can't believe how many people are, uh, the amount of energy they're putting into getting emotional about some effing photograph. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Had to say it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Or you're on the wrong channel, all right? Snap sandwich, blow a gasket, insult people because of their stance on an app and photo. God. What are you doing here? What are you bringing? Actually, you know what? I got one question to all those, to, the, to those people is, what are you bringing here? What are you bringing to this community of intelligent people? What are you bringing with you? What do you got? What are you, what are you bringing here to help the people? Seriously. Just displays of lack of intelligence displays of um all right i'll stop there i'll bite my lip do you see what i mean you guys <laughs> so again i'll try to stay away from the comment section because i just have a lack i have a struggle with with uh the idiots they really can bring a dark cloud to a big bright sunny picnic right every time that's all they got to bring with them is a dark cloud is that all you got yeah i'm bringing my dark cloud with me oh good said nobody ever all right here we go moving along yeah i had a rant sometimes you got to do it right now listen to this 
This is titled Years of Cohabitation. And Bigfoot Doesn't Dig Orange Candy. That's a different kind of title. Hey Steve, thank you for all you do in getting the real facts out there. My experience involves Colorado, private property, and 17 years of Sabe. The Sabe were reading were reasonable, oh, typo, reasonably friendly. They slept by my house. I have photos of body prints and footprints all seasons of the year that I documented them as much as possible. I was a single woman living on a 7,000 foot property with two mobile homes and a main house, my parents. I lived on my mobile home alone with my young grandson. I was and still am raising. He was one year old at the time. I think first encounters became possible because of my non-violent stance. No guns, being female, living alone. At first was the screams. Then later on, curiosity, as they ventured near and stayed by my home. I had a feeling what they were. Believer since the Gimlin, Pitt Patterson film, 67. I wanted to communicate if possible, which I did by playing my flute in the forest. Then I would take them hard candy. The kettle ones. You twist to open. They never ate the orange ones, only cherry and lemon. I got a photo of a complete huge mouth print from cantaloupe slices I had left for them. They, over the years, left me gifts from little twisted stick figures, little stick teepees, about five, six inches high, as well as the same thing, but made with gravel to an empty front yard at night. Made, must have meant made from an empty front yard at night. Big pond included with one to two feet of water. Morning time to morning time at least. A 100 to 150 white round tumbleweeds. I don't know where they came from, as we had none on our Colorado mountain property. I go remove them and put them on an empty horse stall, outdoor double stall, and a few days later in the morning, a yard full of round white tumbleweeds. I refused and offered to publish my photos and allow game trail cams from Dr. I won't even say his name, one I know of, who was writing a book at the time as I didn't want to disturb their habitat as they were a family of four. As I had documented over the years, they had a mom, a dad, two to three-year-old juvenile, and a teenage male. We saw him with a messed up left foot that had only three toes. The right foot had five. When my parents passed in 2013, and we had to sell the property, we heard wood knocks, and the juvenile would always mimic my wood knocks, only occasionally, and play with me. I saw a complete face print on my mom's bedroom window at her house at the top of her mountain after she had passed. I felt that these particular Sabe were my friends, and I felt their sadness and confusion as we left. The night before we left and moved, me and my ex-husband saw four Sabe standing on top of a small ridge on the other side of a field in front of my house, maybe 50 yards or so. But they were illuminated by moonlight and easy to see. That last night, the tall male had looked in my front window overnight because I saw and got photos of them the next morning by my living room window, which the bottom sill of the window was at least six feet from the ground. I also, hold on a minute. What do you need? What do you need for me? Huh? This is the senior cat of the of the pride. Not one of the moms. And uh, it doesn't matter where I go on the property, this thing is in tow. But you gotta go, right? There you go. Fur everywhere. Sorry you guys. I get too distracted here, she comes back up to my lap. Alright. I looked at my front window overnight because I saw and got photos of them the next morning by my living room window, which the bottom sill of the window was at least six feet from the ground. Also, there was a handprint smudge a foot or so from the top of the window. So, Sabe, friend or foe, you ask? In my rare case, evidently, friend. Now, there's no forest I go in that I don't know if they're around or not, and if it's aggressive or not. But now, because of all my unusual knowledge and experiences, as a single older woman, I'm ever so more aware of the woods slash forests and who lives there. I respect that and I go when I should or stay when I should. It's like a built-in intuition 
and never once have I ever been scared or threatened or harmed by them. At least not my particular group. Thank you, Steve. I'll close now. And you can just call me Tammy. No last name, please. And if this doesn't get lost in the shuffle, because I know you have hundreds of emails and gets read, I hope it helps or sheds a new light. Thank you, Steve, and everyone for listening to this book like email. Sorry so long, but lost to say. God bless you and fam, Steve, and all listeners. Excuse me, and all listening and sharing. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you for that. I wonder how many people, I've never done a tally on anything, but I wonder how many people we've had who have ex reported having these, uh, what you might call it a relationship going on with some of these beings on their property. But one question I would have for you is, um, when you go about your business in the day, I don't, wherever, if you go in the forest somewhere, where there's a forest or park, if you are, do you feel, can you feel what I have described as pressure? Do you feel pressure? Do you feel them present right there or there or on that mountain? Like for, for me, when I'm hunting, an example, when I'm thinking about going up there, looking at the, a huge timbered slope on a mountain, and I have places where I just feel, uh, it just makes me go like that. Whoa, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to explain. And I know it's not me playing mind tricks on myself because I'm running up and down that mountain right there. I'm hiking up, up through that pass over the creek and up that slope and over the top of that one up there and not even think about anything. And then when I want to go over to this one, all of a sudden I just get this, mm, and I don't go. So that's how I describe what it feels like to me and I just have called it pressure. So I'm wondering if you get the, if you have the same or if you if you could feel a presence outside your window when they were there. If you could just feel something off. You know what I mean? I know there's a lot of people that know what I mean. And uh, I'd be interested in hearing hearing back from you on that. If you could. And I uh, respect your um, keeping the photos to yourself. I'm down, I'm, I mean, I'm good with that. Doesn't, doesn't bother me the slightest. Now, let's hear somebody else while this cat mauls the shit out of me. What are you doing? All right, hello, my name is Bill and I've seen a, and I've been a believer and human supporter of these amazing animals way before I had what I would say was by far the scariest and yet funny experience of my life. I've been a Bigfoot believer ever since I saw the Patterson Gimlin film when I was about five or six. Well, anyway, the summer between the seventh and the eighth grade, my lovely mother decided that I was going to attend every single free or low cost summer camp she could send to me. I was literally away from home that summer all the way up until two days before school started. Right? That's enough about my summertime blues. On with the story. It scared me to death, but ended with me laughing my butt off. During my final two-week camp, during my final two-week camp was actually a real carrier tent, bed, food, and clothing, honest to goodness, backpacking trip. We started out, we started our trip around the Mammoth Mountain area of California. I will admit my pack was enormous and was killing me, but I never said anything about it. I was really skinny and had long, skinny arms and legs. Everyone back then called me Spider because I looked like a spider monkey. This sounds familiar. I think we may have read this. The first three days were pretty uneventful, but the area, but the area was just amazingly beautiful. However, on the fourth night, we all started hearing tree knocks. This is way before we even knew that knew what tree knocks were or what they meant. There were no howls or whistles any of those nights, so nobody really spoke about the knocks at all. We did tell ghost stories because we were really trying to scare the only two girls that were on the trip with us. I'll admit, none of the stories were very good. That night I crawled into my tent. That was a strategically placed right between the two girls' tents. I laid down with my feet toward the entrance of my tent so I could see the outside so I could watch for shooting stars. Okay, enough backstory. On to the next to last day of camp. We founded the the founded had us all on a hike. Sorry. About every 200 feet or so, they would have one of us stop. And when we were supposed to spend two hours in that spot alone in order to think about what we learned from and about each other. So, as I sat down on a pretty good sized boulder and enjoyed the view of 
one of the girls walking away, LOL. Remember, I was 13 and my hormones were raging out of control throughout my body. <clears throat> so anyway, as the view became just a little less beautiful as they walked out of my sight, I turned around on the rock I was sitting on and began to toss stones into the small creek that was meandering by me. I soon be began to... I soon began to goddess actually close to my age. The stone's a bit harder and flatter. Okay, you, you must have meant I soon began to throw actually close to my age. What? Sorry, there's a major typo there. A, a bit? Okay, I'm going to read this as the way it's spelt, all right? I soon began to goddess actually close to my age. The stone's a bit harder and flatter so I could try and skip them across the water. <laughs> there you go. Well, I am skimming stones and looking around. I started to hear the most eerie whistle I've ever heard. I stopped in mid-skip, trying to figure out who or what was making that scary yet beautiful sound. To my right, I heard a twig. Well, it was more like an entire branch snap. The closest I could describe that sound to would be a Mark McGuire home run. When I finally saw who made that noise, yes who, not what, I actually did pee my pants and then fell backwards off of the rock. My body literally flowed, froze. I couldn't scream, yell, or make any noise of any kind. He, his anatomy, gave him away. By the way, my hormones, hormones were no longer raging out of control. I would say he was probably close to my age because he's about six foot two or six foot three. His face looked young. I was blown away by how human his face looked. Let's read that sentence one more time. I was blown away by how human his face looked. Said what? 98% of the people here? He just stood under a tree holding onto a branch and was just looking at me. I was still frozen in fear when he did something that blew my mind. He picked up a stone and he awkwardly tossed it at the water. It took me, shaking with intense fear, about four stones plopping heavily into the water to realize he was trying to skip stones. With every ounce of, I guess, courage and maybe a little insanity, I picked up a stone, put it in the crook of my index finger and thumb of my right hand and nervously showed him the grip. I cocked my arm back, tilted my body a bit to the right and just happened to glance over at him. And in my honest shock, and yes, a large bit of humor, I actually let out a genuine laugh. I let loose of my rock and I was able to get it to skip about three times. The noise that he made I can only describe as a little girl's giggle. I could see both rows of his teeth. I made a Sasquatch laugh. Well, he let loose of his rock and it didn't even come close to the water. From where he was standing, the creek separated us and we were about 75 to 80 feet apart. His stone, which was about the size of a grapefruit, I should have been more specific. Anyway, his mini boulder hit a tree about 50 feet away from us. Even from that distance, I could tell he had pretty much killed that tree. I couldn't help myself, and even though I was racked with fear, I heard myself begin to laugh hysterically. He made the giggling girl sound again. Never tell them that aloud, just in case they do know English. Now, this part is really funny to me, but also interesting as hell. We played with rocks and water, and in doing so, I totally forgot all about my silly teenage problems and I felt, for a small period of time, I was playing with a friend. He even had the nerve to look down at my wet pants and made a stink face, and I knew he was teasing me for wetting myself. So I jumped into the ice-cold water and started splashing my crotch area with water really quick because it was cold as hell. When I did this, he made another noise that I best describe as a person falling off of a cliff. But looking at his face, I knew he was laughing his ass off at me. It was only about 10 minutes or so later that I heard another one of those eerie but beautiful whistles. This one was coming from the tree line directly behind him. I could not see one that made the whistle, but he looked at me with a sad face and he started to walk away slowly. All I could think to do was to raise my hand and say goodbye. He looked back at me. I heard him say goodbye. Not out loud, but in my head. I've never told anyone about that until just now. I know that many will not believe this piece of my life, but I'm not telling it for them. 
I'm telling it from my old friend. Thank you, Wildcat Bill. And there is one hell of a frickin' story and experience. Not till, haven't told anybody till now, said how many people? Shit pile. Oh, the cat toned down. Take from what you will or leave it, right? But I'll tell you what, that's not the first person to claim to have had a friendly interaction with these forest people when they were, when they were kids. Remember, there was another kid that played with one or a couple kids playing with one in another story quite a while ago. And then the one kid went back there and shot it or something. Somebody shot and killed it. The mom blew a gasket and all hell broke loose. Sorry, rambling. Rambling, that's my problem, is <clears throat> my brain gets thoughts and they spill out of my mouth without control sometimes. That is quite the frickin' share, man. Quite the share. Quite the experience. I wonder how many other people have had that experience and they're not willing to come forward yet, but they're sitting here quiet in the background. Probably quite a few. All right, here we go. This title, It Was All Black and Not a Man. Hi, Steve. Look forward to hearing a story from you every day and appreciate all that you've done in regards to this topic. I had an experience when I was younger that changed my life, even though it wasn't as frightening as the stories you share every day. Like most of those who share their stories with you, I'm an educated person with a master's degree and don't like to be told that I'm a liar. I know the truth. I'm here to share my encounter. All right, you're at the right place. When I was 12 years old, I went to Boy Scout camp in Southwest Indiana. There was a small creek that ran along the camp. It was used to obtain the canoeing merit badge. School buses were used to transport the scouts a few miles upriver. The route the bus took winded through dense woods, sprinkled with cornfields here and there. Being antisocial, I sat by myself on the back of the bus. As I was looking out the window, we started to approach a large red barn and I noticed a large black figure a, a few feet from the edge of the cornfield. As we got closer, the figure took one step into the cornfield and was completely out of sight as we passed by. I sat up in my seat to look around the bus to see if anyone else saw the same thing. Unfortunately, no one else did. Corn in Indiana can grow eight to nine feet, and this figure stood just a few inches lower than the top of the corn stalks. It was all black and was not a man, and I know that for sure. I don't proactively share my story, but if someone asks, I'm not afraid to share it, and I know what I saw. I currently live in Utah and have driven all over the United States. Here comes Adventure Dog now. What are you doing? Don't chase the cat, don't hit the tripod. Right. I cur Sorry guys. I currently live in Utah and have driven all over the United States. I have many friends and family members that live in Bigfoot hotspots in California, Oregon, Eastern Texas, Utah, and Idaho. I don't proactively look for these creatures, but I'm always alert as I'm driving through or staying in these areas. I've always had a feeling that I would see another one of the damn things in the future, but definitely don't want to. I appreciate what you, Dave Plyde, Scott Carpenter have done and appreciate your research and time. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Thanks, Darren Peterson. Darren, you did all the help you can do. Not, well, I shouldn't say all the help you can do. You've done a pile of help just doing what you've just done. He's coming forward and uh, shared honestly and bravely to the people and told the truth. That's about the best thing anybody can do, especially today, right? All right, here comes another one. This is a file, this file of my iCloud. There's a few in here mixed in that have been read before, so it's a bit of a roll of the dice, all right, you guys? This is titled, He Froze With His Back To Me. This sounds familiar, but that could be a familiar description of what's happened with various people. We'll see. Hey Steve, my name is Brooke, I'm 27, and I live in blank. Please, if you share this, do not share the location because I know people who still have sightings around where I grew up. I've shared some of my encounters and experiences with Scott Carpenter a little while back, and this happened the same place. I just watched your video, 
Its face was absolute human, titled, and I remembered something that's very important about a fire on our road. In 2017, my husband and I were living in the home I grew up in. My papa had chickens at our house in a barn and, and some also in pens around the yard. I'm very observant and noticed that chickens were missing out of the pens that were there the evening before, just like when I was a kid. These pens did not have doors. In order to get a chicken out, you'd have to lift the bottom up and reach under to get it out. In the front of the house, there's a hill that goes up to my pop's chicken lot. We got a new dog and decided at midnight one night he needed to go outside to use the bathroom. This is January, so it was really cold outside. As I was walking him in the front yard, I caught movement up on the hill. I assumed that it was Papa and I yelled out, quote, Pop, what are you doing up there at this time of night? It's cold. You're too old to be out there. End quote, no reply. I yelled this time a lot louder, Hey, Papa! No reply. As I'm looking at him and yelling out, he froze with his back to me and slowly walked, turned to the right and walked into the shadow of the chicken house where it was pitch black. I never seen his face. I walked in the house, told my husband that Pop was getting old. He can't hear nothing anymore. He laughed at me and asked what I was talking about and I told him what had just happened. He said, your Pop left from up there around nine and went home. Well, there is someone up there, I said, and they are dressed in dark clothes. He grabbed his gun and light and called Pop and went up there, and we didn't find anything, and there were no tracks from a vehicle besides Pop's. The reason I thought that it was my Pop's in the first place is because he's tall, a very broad man. He's 6'2", as a Vietnam vet, used to lift weights, so he's really wide at his shoulders. The same week this happened, our, the same week this happened, our woods were set on fire from the highway and burned all the way up to the first house on both sides of our dirt road, almost a mile of woodland each way. We were friends with the sheriff and he called my uncle at three in the morning to let him know that someone set our woods on fire. He drove to the end of the road and there were fire trucks, police officers, the forestry service, and black SUVs. Odd. They were only watering down at the highway so it wouldn't jump across the other side. They were standing there just watching it burn, my uncle said. The crazy thing about it is where the woods were burned on both sides are cave systems that were gold mines back in the day. My cousins and I used to play in them. This past year, through watching your channel, I've started asking people who live or lived around where I grew up if they ever seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. It's insane the amount of sightings and encounters in this town, and there have been many around where the woods were burnt. Yet no one speaks about it. There's an episode of an incident on Animal Planet where a large hairy creature ran across Town Creek Church Road in 2011, and it's on a police officer's dash cam. I know the officer personally, and he said that BFRO a-holes treated it like a joke off camera. Also, this town has a ranger camp, and where I grew up, helicopters flew over these woods very low every now and then, and during the middle of the night, too. Thank you for taking the time to read this, and thank you for all that you do. Keep it up. Brooke Elaine Kraft. Brooke, appreciate you big time. Appreciate you taking your time to send that in. It's kind of funny. Look, is that a possibly a coincidence that that group's been named and black SUVs in the same area? Right? How many times has that gone down? Odd, isn't it? Or is it? What are you doing? Doing your job? Good. <laughs> but anyway, um, one thing that I wonder, so, I have, you guys know I've spent a shit pile of time in the length of this province, the width of this province, and other places outside of province. And where I was previously living for I don't know how many years, 16, 18, whatever it was. As far as I'm concerned, that area alone, those coastal mountains of British Columbia, are possibly, it's possibly ground zero for the most dense population or activity or whatever you want to call it that I know of in the province, including Vancouver Island. There's just so many sightings around there. It's absolutely ridiculous. The amount of people that I came across when I was looking intentionally was, I think, 48 
I believe first hand first hand witnesses. And I never seen a black SUV with guys with sunglasses and suits in this in the forest once. Never on the on the forest service roads, not once. Never. And then uh, a lot of the places here I frequent and I've taken you guys to uh, getting close to the coast on the island. Same thing, I've never seen them here ever. Ever. Never. Although, uh, I believe Dave reported on investigated a missing man in Harrison Lake. And there's a lot of real weird shit went down with that missing case, including special military and I believe US military as well came up. We're jumping out of helicopters and shit. What's up with that? All right? What's up with that? But it's it's confusing because these people, whoever these groups of people are, they do not routinely go to where there are sightings all the time. That's for me seeing firsthand. They don't. Why not? What is it they're going? What is it they know about? What is it they're looking for? Who is it they're looking for? Who is it they're keeping tabs on? Who is it they're trying to block? Who is it? Do you know what I mean? Because if it's just your clap classic, typical, what we describe as a Sasquatch Sabe forest person. I mean, there's so many sightings right behind me, right back here on this river system in this valley. It's stupid. Well, there's no, nobody's, nobody's running around here in SUVs stopping people from driving and, and blocking them from going up a trail that I know of. Why not? Why only in the, some of these instant, it's instances? Why? Right? Why is that? Can you guys see this cat on my left? <laughs> oh my god. Animals! What are you doing, cat? You listening and learning? Have you seen anything that we uh, don't know about? And then I have my uh, going backdrop sound. All right, there you go. That's our intermission. Back at it. Anyway, it's just a slight observation. Well, actually, no. Our my First Nations hero lady friends, they have reported to me some very odd shit going on with military on the coast of the island here. So I stand corrected. In a bit. In a, in a way. They reported some military people doing really weird shit on the coast here. So, there you go. I just recalled that. Now, moving along. Alright, here we go. Mark, this is red. This is titled. I have had multiple encounters. Hi, uh, Steve. Mike from Australia here. I really appreciate you doing what you believe in. I've had multiple encounters, and people think I'm nuts because I want to warn them of the dangers. And now I will not tolerate wankers like Joe Rogan making dickhead about it, or news readers who play dumb. Full stop. A 50. And in Northeast Victoria. Is in Australia? I'll back you up from here if I can. I've heard them growl and follow me now and then, but 18 years ago it changed my life forever. Me and a friend were mad trout fishermen. He had an old land cruiser with 33 inch treads, so the Blue Range Mountains was a must. The best river we could find was the Upper Buffalo where the river was like a creek. We spun, we spun with blue and red kelters and would walk sometime three or four kilometers upstream at the crack of dawn. This one morning I was getting a bad feeling on a stretch of water we hadn't fished before. Like spirits warning us to go back. Then I could hear a woofing noise from above. When I looked up, two large cones of bark from the tall white gum two large white cones of bark from the tall white gum trees came hurtling down straight for us. I yelled, hey move while stepping back. They were almost a meter long with a sharp point. Almost killed us. No shit. What the F. We got over it and kept going. Within the next 100 meters, this bad smell hit us. It was like gangrene. Not dead smell. I said, okay, let's go back. Something's not right. He said, come on. I've been hunting for 
I've been hunting for a year. It's nothing. We pressed on till we came to an elbow in the river shaded with willow trees and beautiful fishing holes. Best spot ever. We noticed there was no grass at all and the area looked padded down. To the side, there was a passage at least 30 feet wide and maybe an eighth of a mile long with no trees, just small shrubs. As I looked away at 45 degrees, I heard a twig break, so I looked back and had and had the latest Polaroids on and couldn't see anything. Okay, sunglasses. And couldn't see anything else there. As I went to look away again, I seen a big hairy man jump from one side to the other like nothing. He must have been nine feet if he was standing up at about three to four feet wide. And his feet were 10 feet off the ground. Then the smell faded away almost black in color and hairy, not furry. I can tell you, Steve, in those days I was a tough guy and would stand up to three men any time. I think that day I almost swallowed my tongue and haven't been back there since. One of the Aboriginal elders told, we don't talk about them and they are not animals, they are bush people. It's a pity the dumb white man effed it all up for everyone. We also trade with them and they would look after us too. Please share this one, Mike. Mike, shared. Shared. It's endless. Endless. Appreciate you, Mike. You got anything else you want to you want to send our way from down there, man? Give her. It'll get to me. I'll share it eventually. Everybody needs to be heard. The truth is out. It's out of the. the it's out of the bag. All right, First Nation Alaskan shares. Hey Steve, I'm a First Nations Alaskan, raised in the bush, Alaska and Bristol Bay. The area around back home has always had stories, sightings, and high strangeness. I'll share one encounter that stands out. It was the fall of 2006, September 13th to be exact. Me and my cousin and uncle were heading up the Nushagak River. We were on an adventure to pan gold far north of us towards Iliamna on a tributary of the Nushagak River. It took two days of river travel in a 22 foot flat bottom skiff. The afternoon was sunny and bright and we were excited to get rich panning and we we're excited to get rich panning gold. What a joke that turned into. We dropped my uncle off at an empty fishing game sonar station, Shack Slash Cabin. It was home base for the next week. Me and my cousin headed for a creek a couple bends back on the river to check on a black spot we spotted on our way up and I wanted to go and I wanted a black bear rug. Read this one, damn it. It was quite a while ago so I'll finish it. We were turning onto the creek from the river and I saw what we thought was a large black bear. I signaled my cousin to slow down, shoulder my odd sex and put the crosshairs center mass and squeeze the trigger. All hell broke loose when that 180 grain core lock hollow point. This, the thing, this thing stood up and it was at least 70 yards away and screamed the most awful guttural howl slash yelp and took off. And rocks and sticks and clumps of dirt and grass started raining on us. We were turning the skiff around with paddles and we're freaking the F out. I saw three other creatures along the creek side between us and the main river. I yelled for my cousin to start the kicker and get us up and moving. Hold on, she's got a stick wrapped around the tripod. <clears throat> I was firing pop shots at the water's edge. The creek was 15 to 20 feet wide and I felt our lives were in serious danger. Do you think? I emptied the odd six and had pulled the 44 mag revolver from the chest holster and cocked it ready for one of these things to jump at us going by. But they took off while we zipped by and hit the main river back to the shack slash cabin. Even typing this, thinking about it, raises the hair all over my body because they knew where we were going. It seems they only took off to meet us there. Luckily, the shack slash cabin was on the other side of the river from the creek we left. When the skiff hit the gravel shore, I was in shock. I was sorry, I was in the shack digging out more ammo and shaking very hard. It was intense, and my uncle thought we just went and killed a half a. Sorry, it was intense 
and my uncle thought we just went and killed a half a gallon of vodka and were hallucinating or something. Just then the rock started hitting the shack. It sounded like a hailstorm. My cousin ran into the shack and started mumbling nonsense and started crying. I looked out the door and could only see one swaying back and forth making a clicking, hooting sound. The rock stopped and it quieted down. Quietened down. My uncle's pretty much deaf and his eyesight wasn't much better and he was convinced it was kids from the village down river messing with us. I couldn't get my cousin to snap out of his denial of what was happening. It was getting dark and my uncle cooked dinner and went to bed. All the while I'm going from little window to little window, just waiting for an assault of some kind. My cousin wouldn't engage in any conversation, period, just staring at nothing. I had a 12 gauge 30 odd 6 and my 44 mag revolver. I felt I could at least keep something from getting all the way in the shack if it came to that. Thankfully it didn't come to that. All that happened that night was a lot of staring in the little windows, growling, and only some banging on the shack. It seemed like they were just displaying dominance, kind of bullying like behavior. I saw at least four different faces looking in those windows. All were very large and the guttural growling was overwhelming at times. It rattled the pan on the stove when they growled. I fought, I fought hard not to open fire through the window. The only thing that kept me from shooting was not knowing how many were actually there. My view of the surrounding area was always hampered by one of these things. It finally stopped around 2 in the morning. All the growling subsided and only a strange garbled noise was heard. I was, I was loaded in the skiff, waiting on my cousin and uncle at first light. I've been back there, and unfortunately I don't have contact with that uncle or cousin anymore. That's a familiar one. It's like they can't wrap their minds around the experience and refuse to even bring up the subject. Never even put dirt in a gold pan either. I have many other experiences in the bush. None are as intense, but they're all around the Nushagak River drainage. I don't care if you use my store on your channel. My name is Fred, I'm 45, and am, I am of Alaska Native heritage. So many people back home have encountered this creature and don't talk about it. I just don't understand. I'm scared, I guess. Anyways, love the channel, appreciate your efforts, and getting the truth out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fred, I appreciate you, man. That's scary shit, and that's so, so similar to those. Remember the, uh, there's experience in uh, Mount St. Helens, Ape Canyon, years ago. Documented investigators went up there, detectives went up there, the newspaper went up there, and uh, those lot, those miners did the same thing. They saw one of these things and shot it. I believe it went up down the bank into the river, and they think it washed away, or the other ones carried it away during the day or night or something. And then all hell broke loose in that cabin, beating on the roof, the walls chinked a log loose in the wall and a hairy arm came in and felt around grabbed an axe handle and was pulling out the guy said he spun the axe handle and blocked going out the hole ran his barrel up there and pulled the trigger they're shooting through the walls at them but nobody was killed weird right nobody was killed there has been a lot of hey it's okay There's been a lot of people have reported that there is an aggressive, there are aggressive bush people in Alaska. They don't like humans and have been violent towards them. I don't know how I've been there. But anyway, I'm going to get going. On that note though, Fred, uh, I hope to be back in Alaska fairly soon now that we're allowed to travel again. And uh, I'm going to, uh, if you're around Anchorage, maybe we could hook up. And you could share some more experiences with me. I'd appreciate that. Believe it or not, I have some, I have some trail cameras hidden in the mountains of the Chugach Mountains, and I want to hike up there and see if I can retrieve them. I specifically left them there for to see if I could get big monster doll rams on there, which I don't think anybody has before. So, anyway, there you go. This weekend is complete chaos for me. I gotta go, but I'll be back shortly. And uh, try not to blow gasket on each other, you guys, all right?
try to remember that every every single one of us is on our own personal ride. This lifetime is all yours. Okay? We don't have to uh, please anybody here. We don't have to agree with anybody. We don't have to jump in anybody's bandwagon. All we gotta do is support each other and agree to take from take from it what you will or leave it. That's all you gotta do. Take from it what you will or leave it. Instead of blowing a gasket insulting people or trying to shame them into thinking the way you think or shame them into not saying what they don't want you to say. It's absolutely wrong. It's the wrong thing to do. So if that, if that sounds familiar to you, get your head out of your ass, man.